Usually, when we think about war games, the first association that we get is Call of Duty and other FPSs and RTSs, where the focus is mostly on grim and serious situations and the showcase of war as brutal as it is, or the game is just trying to have fun with it. But here comes a game that focuses more on the human side in war, when you're truly just trying to do the good thing and realizing that the other side, as horrible as it is, at the end of the day is also human. Well, that's my attempt of an introduction to this review. Let's just get on with it, shall we? Today, we're reviewing Valkyria Chronicles. Valkyria Chronicles is set in the fictional continent of Europe, Europa. How original. The year is 1935, the Second European War has began. As you can see, this game borrows heavily from World War I and World War II, and also some mythos about Valkyria, so do bear that in mind as we continue to review this game. So, on one side you have the autocratic Eastern European Imperial Alliance, shortened the Empire, who attacked the Atlantic Federation to the west because of a shortage of Ragnite. It's basically a multi-purpose resource that enables you to heal, make fuel, make grenades, it's quite important to the economy. But you're not playing as these two factions, or one or the other, no. You're playing as the Principality of Gallia. Gallia for short, this small independent neutral country that has been invaded by the Empire because they're short on Ragnite, and this country is full of Ragnite, and it's small, let's take it. Yeah, because, you know, in history, never once did it happen that a large nation attacked a small nation, and the small nation, through smart tactical maneuvers and sheer willpower, managed to beat them back. Now, now. Well, the game starts, and we're following Velking Gunter, the protagonist of this game. He goes back to his hometown of Brule, where Alicia Melkiat, the town captain, apprehends them, apprehends him, sorry, for the suspicion of him being an imperial spy, because war is looming around and Brule is a border town right next to the Empire. Isara, the adopted sister, Welkin comes and clarifies the situation, and he's cleared to pick up his stuff and evacuate, but not before the Empire strikes, because of course it has to. You deal with a few scouts, later a small squad and a tank, and then you go to Rangris, which is the capital of Gallia. Welkin and Alicia and the rest that followed enlist in the militia to defend Gallia from the Imperial invade. The story gives enough spotlight to the protagonists and antagonists that you can grasp their motivations and goals. Sadly, it becomes more anime cliché near the end, I won't spoil it, but overall the story is good. It has enough of dramatic, humorous moments to keep it going, and what makes it more special and unique in this is the lore. For example, the Darkens are the Jews and Gypsies in this game. They're openly persecuted by the Empire, which puts them into labor camps to mine for Ragnite, and the Empire even has Darksen hunters, so there's a common practice of hunting the Darksens. And one mission, in particular for one character, rewards in Gallia about you hunting down these Darksen hunters and making sure that none of them escape alive. What is also interesting in the lore is the small details, for example how the Imperial soldiers look. If you pay attention to them, they look quite a medieval, and that is because the Empire is rooted strongly in medieval social norms and traditions, so the armor that they're wearing was worn more for ceremonial reasons, but was kept there just for that purpose, for a sort, for a sort of identity. And they, for example, tradition, the tradition is such that they pledge their allegiance to the Emperor not to the state. That shows how the whole society works and it's strongly conservative. What is also unique for me is that the game shows common men and women fighting for their country and the cast here is quite diverse, whether you pick age or anything else. For example, you have a young shock trooper at the age of 13 because she's smart enough tactically that she can enlist and the army allowed that. And then you have a shock trooper from the old war, the first European war, at the age of 65. You have a gay guy, you have a woman that hates men, you have a man that hates women, people that hate Darksons, you have, I think, three Darksons that are also fighting for this country, and this extends just beyond, you know, 
preferences and age. For example, some have allergies to certain types of terrain. So, for example, you have a few guys that are allergic to desert, you have some allergic to pollen, etc. Or they fear and hate a certain type of enemy. For example, you have one scout who hates troopers, so whenever she engages against the enemy that is a shock trooper, she has lowered combat efficiency. And it's really this that makes the game unique. Like, even these characters that you enlist and put on the field, although they don't get the spotlight, they don't get any cutscenes in which they speak, the short biography that you can read from them, and especially their potentials that are listed there, is what gives them flavor. But we'll explain that in the gameplay, which is happening right now. The game is a turn-based action strategy game. You select the roster for deployment, you can pick, I think, 25 soldiers. You deploy them on the map, then you select one of them, you can move them, you can do an action which can be shooting, throwing a grenade, healing or repairing, depending on the class. Now, there are five classes in total. Scouts, they have the most movement points, so they're good at scouting and capturing camps if you can evade the enemy shooting you. They're also lethal if you manage to score headshots. Shock troopers, they're durable, they're good in defense and offense, they have a submachine gun so they have more shots but they're less accurate as a result. Engineers are more fragile compared to scouts but their key role is that they can repair your tank and they can resupply other soldiers with ammo and grenades. Snipers, well you know what a sniper does now don't you? Well the thing is long range he has low HP, low movement points, and he has only three shots. So it's important that you also have some engineers if you plan to use them extensively. Lancers, they carry lancers, which are basically anti-tank weapons. Same as snipers, they have three shots. They're resistant to explosive damage, but they do not. But they take the normal amount of damage when someone's using small firearms, which includes some machine guns, rifles, and tank-mounted machine guns. Now, there are potentials here in this game, which also adds a bit more characterization to the soldiers that you're deploying on the field. There are two types, personal and battle. Personal potentials are generally more unique. They can be good or bad. They trigger randomly depending on the circumstances and the random number generator. For example, you have this shock trooper, Jane Turner, who hates Imperials. And she's also a sadist, so she likes inflicting pain. So whenever she is fighting Imperials, which is all the time, there's also a chance of these two potential triggering, giving her more damage to kill them. So she's excellent at that. Her potential that is negative is child of nature, so whenever she's fighting in a city, there's a chance that she feels a bit down, and therefore she doesn't perform as well. Bell potentials are always positive you have four of them, compared to the person who can be three or four. So you have four battle potentials, you get them when you upgrade the class at the training field, and you upgrade the whole class. It's not like you can pick a specific soldier and then upgrade them as you will, instead the whole class moves to the next level. You also have the research and development building, where you research new weapons, armor, and upgrades for your tanks. For the classes, you'll need XP, or experience. For the upgrades, you'll need ducats, which is the money used in Gallia. Training the classes also upgrades their stats, but it also gives them new weapons. For example, the scouts can use rifle grenades, the flamethrower can be used by the shock troopers, and lancers can use hand mortars, which doesn't sound as cool as you might think. The range is rather short, but it's good for cleaning trenches. You can also get new weapons by defeating enemy aces. These guys are unique and named enemies on the field and they come whether from an ordinary scout to a small to a light, medium or heavy tank. The weapons are generally stronger but they lack accuracy and this is why I like the game's lore so much. Everything even to the weapons has that difference. For example, generally Galleon weapons are accurate, moderately powerful, while the Imperials are focusing on firepower exclusively at the detriment of accuracy. For example, like if an Imperial manages to hit you with a submachine gun, you'll be taking a lot of damage, but that's if he can manage to hit you because the accuracy is low. Though I do have to say that there are some deficiencies to this game. For example, the AI. Sometimes the AI goes full mental reverse and makes the game easy at certain points. For example, well, when it just sends scouts after scouts 
and shock troopers after shock troopers that you just mow down like nobody's business and makes the game easier in that sense but that's more the exception rather than the rule the graphics i have to say are nice and easy on the eyes and they're unique because of the canvas engine that was used that gives the game a feeling of watercolor painting both in gameplay and cutscenes. Explosions look decent enough, but nothing on the level of Michael Bay, and even on medium settings, the game looks good. Voice acting is done admirably well, although I have to say that certain voice actors could have put more effort in certain scenes, like Prince Maximilian. I feel like in some scenes, while he kept his personality, the voice that should have been there, you know, the feeling just didn't reach out to me. Sound effects are on spot, Every weapon has a distinct sound, so you won't mix one variant of a submachine gun with another. Music is appropriate for the scenes that it plays, and a few of the tracks I do like, like Empty Loneliness, which is used in more dramatic and human moments in which there's no combat, they're just talking about what they will do after the war and what they need to do, the small moments that they appreciate. The soundtrack overall is well done. Overall, the verdict for this game, I have to give it an 8 out of 10. If it's on sale, I strongly suggest you to buy it, because you won't regret it. It's a long game, it's a good game, it's also an old game, released in 2008 for the PlayStation, in 2014 for the PC, and I think in 2016 or 17 for the PlayStation 4. And it sold well in all of those cases. I thank you for watching my review, I hope that you found it entertaining and informative. See you all later. I'll be there to help you. You know, it's funny.